Okay, welcome everyone to yet another update from Strix. Uh, today we're going to go through the interim results. Uh, as, as always, you know, this has been a, a very busy time. We've got a lot to go through in this presentation, so I'm going to run through it relatively quickly. And as Hannah said, hopefully there'll be uh, plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, I'm going to start, first of all, with, with a, a bit of a thank you to everybody on the call at the moment, because uh, you're all working from home, or a lot of you have been working from home. You've obviously gone out and bought plenty of new kettles. Uh, which has really sort of helped us in the first half of the year, as you'll start seeing when we go through the numbers. So I'll now start maybe just going through the highlights first. Uh, we're going to go through the numbers and then we'll break down into the various categories to give you just a bit more detail of, of what's happening now and you know, where we are in terms of our journey in, in, in growth um, over the next five year plan. So starting with the highlights, very strong set of results for the first half of the year. You're yeah, both against the COVID impact of 2020, but I guess even more pleasing for us is the performance against 2019. From a revenue point of view uh, and adjusted EBITDA, we were up nearly 60% and 50% respectively versus last year, and, and nearly 25% up in revenue uh, versus that pre-pandemic 2019. So I think that's really demonstrated the resilience of our business and, and how we were able to manage the cost during such disruptive times. A net debt um, saw an increase with the funding of Lyca, as well as obviously with the new factory in China. Uh, and given our strong performance, the board has declared an increase in the interim dividend to 2.75 pence. And we remain completely committed to our progressive dividend linked to underlying earnings. So obviously at the full year, we will make the adjustment to whatever that underlying earning position will be. As previously promised, we've now launched a, a new sustainability report. Uh, so that's now available online uh, with a commitment to decarbonisation target for scope one and two to be net zero by 2023. So that's well ahead of the Paris Agreement. And you know, from what we've seen so far, you seem to be well ahead of our peer group, particularly in AIM. Um, that actually now forms a very fundamental part of our business. And as you'll see when we go to some of the new products, it's a, a very strong focus in our new product development as well going forward. We continue to drive our business in compliance with the, the range of international standards. That's, that's always been the core to our business. And once again, we are very proud to have achieved the benchmark status again in our key manufacturing locations as well as here in our head office on the Isle of Man. That is the, the highest accolade you can get from, from the ISO audits. Um, so I think you yeah, credit to the team that's been able to achieve that. You'll be familiar by now that we also like to, to look after and to protect our IP and, and to make sure there's no unsafe products on the market. Yeah, so far, so far since listing, we've had 66 actions, something we continue to do. It has slowed a little bit due to the pandemic, you know, with cop the copyists having you're quite restricted access due to the travel constraints out and, and into China, which obviously also helps our footprint as well. Uh, and many, many of the regulatory authorities have been working reduced hours. So that has slowed that down some of that, that progress, although we continue to, to monitor that very carefully. We've also been very active on our strategic initiatives since we last met. Yeah, we've strengthened our resources to make sure we've got everything we need for our five-year plan. Uh, we've completed a new factory to double our capacity on time and on budget during a pandemic period. Uh, we've gained a further 1% value share in our core business. We continue to integrate Leica, the new acquisition into our business, and we will launch more than 20 products or updates this year and have secured further contracts with the Halo Pure in China, bringing the total number of contracts to seven against our commitment of 10 for the full year. So you're a very busy time and we'll obviously go into more detail as we go into the categories. I can move to the next slide um, just to look how we're performing against those medium term targets we set uh, in our capital markets day. <clears throat> From a revenue point of view, you know, very much on track, strong first half. You know, we remain committed to our five year plan and we've maintained our garden guidance for a 30% increase for the full year this year. As I mentioned, we've further grown in our core kettle business. We had set a target to increase by 3% in five years. When in truth, we've already grown 2% in just 14 months. So yeah, that, that target is, is certainly well ahead of schedule. Uh, and yeah, maybe in hindsight, we could, have, we could have stretched that a bit further and we will obviously continue to grow that target. We've set very ambitious goals for the net zero and we've launched that sustainable, innovative, dependable strategy, which you'll find online. Um, seems very ambitious, although we believe very achievable targets uh, and well ahead of the agreements and our peers. We've also put out um, a, a document on diversity as well. Um, so again, trying to, to lead the way in, in terms of where we are positioned as a business for sustainability and diversity. With our continued focus on efficiency and cost measures, you're coupled with you know, our strong cash generation capability, you know, which will now return to circa 80% of EBITDA following completion of the factory. We remain fully committed, as I say, to our progressive dividend 
and they've already announced that 2.7 pence, sorry, 2.75 pence dividend for the half year. And throughout that pandemic, yeah, we've really taken the opportunity to strengthen our management and our skill sets to ensure we've got the right people in place um, within the business to, to meet those targets. Uh, the latest addition actually being a chief technology officer uh, who will join uh, in November of this year with extensive experience in the successful and timely implementation of and, and commercialization of new products. So that will be a very welcome addition. We've also in, internally also significantly strengthened the areas of digital marketing as we start to bring more and more of the products to market with our own brands. So with that as a, an overview, I'm just going to pass over to Rogers uh, and let her run through the financial highlights. Thank you, Mark. So um, some financial highlights here. So results uh, for the first half were encouraging, where revenue increased 57.6%, reported at 54.7 million. So like her results now uh, for the six months were fully incorporated Organic results are equally promising with organic growth at 28.5% and which was above the pre-pandemic level. Absolute gross profit growth was impressive at 48.6% up and that's mainly due to the Leica addition and strong cattle control sales. Organic growth was also very strong at 26.8% increase. Adjusted EBITDA grew by 27.9%, and that's with the addition of Leica. And on an organic basis, um, Strict's core EBITDA grew by 15.4%. Um, adjusted before tax reported growth of 30.7%, and with an organic growth of 19.8%. So net debt increased by 9.1 million to 46 million, and that uh, is before the Leica earnouts. Um, net debt EBITDA multiple tracked at 1.1 time ratio and it increased modestly by 0.1 times from, from year end and that is despite of the final investment outlays for Leica and the new factory capex which were all incurred in first half. So over to the next slide more on the profit and loss summary. So revenue increased the, to the pre-pandemic level where comparison to FY19 showed a remarkable 24.6% improvement. Uh, in terms of the categories, so cattle control grew at 35%, water at 98% and appliances at more than eightfold, though it stemmed from a lower base. Adjusted profit, gross profit improved 48.6%, but margins declined which predominantly is due to the addition of Leica of a different margin structure than cattle controls. There is a bit more of an analysis of margin in the following slide. Growth in adjusted EBITDA was 27.9% less than that of gross margin, again reflecting the effect of a low margin of a Leica business. However, we did resume investment in key resources in the water and appliance segment, and we also have uh, increased AMP spending ahead of uh, quite a lot of new product launches. Um, we did experience some short term supply chain costs um, in the first half, and that hopefully is quite short term, um, but it did contribute to higher operating costs um, for the first six months. Um, exceptional costs for the first half was 4.8 million. Uh, mainly consisted of two major um, outlays, um, that is the Leica related acquisition cost of 1.3 million and the factory relocation project of two and a half million. The SPP cost was substantially reduced to 600K uh, from 1 million of last interims. Adjusted PAT improved by 25.5%. Uh, taxes was accrued for China and now with the addition of Italy which led to a 6.8% for the interims. For full year guidance, um, we are looking at an effective tax rate of 5% or even lower, because we are looking at some tax savings um, measures that uh, we're, hope we're hopeful to achieve in the second half. Um, from the latest discussion with our tax advisor, the, the RLMN tax rate for strikes is expected to be kept at 0% as uh, we are way below the radar for the minimum tax um, criteria. So more on to the gross margin analysis. So the six months gross profit margin saw a dilution of 2.3% to 37.5%. 
Um, the primary factor is due to the one-time full dilution of Leica, where it has a 2.8% dilution effect to the group's gross margin. Um, there are many factors that have driven the movement of the margin, and here I have categorized it into four major groups where we're hoping to show the underlying um, drivers behind um, each of the categories. And each of the way that we analyze it is that um, we're trying to show uh, what the direct uh, inference drivers are that are closely correlated to the commercial side. So for cattle controls, it's showing a positive of 0.1%, meaning it's fairly constant to last year. Included in that analysis is sales mix, drug of mix, uh, volume growth, commodity cost increase, and currency effect. So all of these now, mixed, we analyze it and uh, uh, blend and add it together, we saw a 0.1% um, increase, so pretty well constant. Uh, the Leica consolidation I mentioned already is a 2.8% uh, uh, pure uh, mathematical dilution. Uh, operations, a 0.2% improvement, actually, um, at strict operational efficiency and um, driving for operational excellence is at the heart of Strix. And during the pandemic, um, we experienced rising labor wages pressure as China has uh, domestically is doing really well. So there's been a lot of pressure on manufacturing and therefore on skillful labors. So we did need to increase uh, labor wages to keep the good ones. And that has largely eroded our operational costs, uh, operational savings, and therefore resulted at 0.2% improvement. Organic water and appliances segment is growing, and they are similar to the Leica margin structure, where the higher the growth of the lower margin categories, it will give us a natural dilution. The supply chain challenges that we faced in the first half resulted in a lower weighting of the organic water volume versus the cattle control volume, and therefore led to a small improvement in the margin. So we have since re revised our operations roadmap, where we will expand the insourcing of the water products to make it all in-house, therefore allowing us to secure the supply chain, and, all, and as well as, most importantly, is to earn in incremental profits of more vertical integration. Cash flow highlights. Um, this slide here shows the net debt movements from last year year end uh, to the first half interim. Um, we do continue to have fo to focus on cash preservation. Um, the one important point to note is this: the minimal movement here, where uh, working capital movement is a minimal sw swing of only a 400k outflow. And that is despite of uh, the severe headwinds that we are seeing in the supply chain. So with Leica now fully on board, we managed to keep the Leica working capital balance. And in the coming six to um, 12 months, we'll continue to unwind the capital uh, working capital structure uh, within Leica. But for the time being, we managed to keep it balanced as it used to be an owner's managed business with very, uh, with, which they did not have very good supply chain management structure. The half year capex was 8.5 million, where 5 million is related to the, to, to the last outlay of the new factory, and the 3.5 million is um, for the normal um, operations capex. The acquisition of 1.6 million here is related to the Leica acquisition, which is the last, very last bit of um, the whole acquisition. And this altogether resulted in a 48% cash conversion. And, but if we were to exclude all the one-time significant cash outlay, um, the conversion should re improve back to 82%, which is the normalized um, cash conversion of the Strix model. So um, a few points on the net debt. So net debt from year end um, to now is 46 million, and, but the liquidity pool has improved to 34 million. Um, the net debt EBITDA ratio is 1.1 time, which is quite below the 2.5 time bank covenant. So we're working towards to hopefully drive it down to one times at year end. So battery completion status is that um, it's now fully completed on time and on budget. So it gave us 80% increase in capacity as a start. And with more insourcing plans, we project a 65% utilization by year end. 
over 750 employees, including all the workers, were transferred, where 73% assembly lines were automated. So with the additional capacity that we have now, which is uh, the new factory is uh, running at the same operating cost at where you used to have with the rental factory, it undoubtedly will allow us to maximize the economic returns to the company. So a few points here just to, re to remind and to emphasize the capital allocation priorities where Strict maintain a balanced capital allocation model where we are supported by our strong cash generation ability along with our resilient business model. So the four capital allocation priorities are very well managed with strategic projects initiated and completed successfully on time and on budget. And that's despite of the headwinds we've been facing. We're maintaining a robust balance sheet with the net at multiple ratios sitting comfortably at the 1.1 time at interest. So with that, I would like to pass it back to Mark to continue more on the commercial update. Great, thank you very much, Rodriguez. So what we'll do now is we'll, we'll dig a little bit deeper now into the sort of the three core categories of the business uh, before looking at some of the other projects. And we'll start by obviously starting with, with that, the core business, which was the, the, the cattle business. Um, as, as we anticipated, there was a very, very strong rebound from the outbreak of the pandemic, you know, with stocks being refilled in, in the second half of 2020. And those strong sales continue to go on into the first half of this year, um, as restrictions from the lockdowns increased the actual average expenditure for home improvements and appliances with, with all of you working from home. Now, this was particularly true both for the regulated market, but also the rest, less regulated market, where both the UK and Russia both reported double digit growth. Um, Strix is actually really well positioned to maximize these opportunities. Uh, and with its wide footprint and the scale of the products that we have, particularly given the restrictions on, on traveling to and from China, you know, it certainly helped us in terms of our position versus our competitors. You know, clearly, the copy is based in China, do not really have access to, to Europe, and yeah, the travel restrictions doesn't allow people to go into China either. Uh, and therefore, yeah, our own position gives us a, a much stronger position, and we actually secured growth both in the less regulated and in the, the regulated markets during the period, giving us that 2% that increase since we announced our targets back in October of last year. Furthermore, we've actually seen a very positive product mix with a shift to the higher value controls within that regulated segment. Uh, and also higher end appliances, which does help to improve our average selling price in, the, in this segment. We've also taken a very different strategy with respect to price negotiations. So as you saw from, from the, um, the margin analysis, we've managed to actually significantly reduce, in fact, improve in many cases, the margins for, for the cattle part of the business. Given it's a, a second or third tier supplier with the cattle controls, yeah, there is always what we call a, a bullwhip effect, where you get quite... Um, magnified uh, impact for, for, the, for the consumer market fluctuations. And they can take quite a little bit of time to settle. Uh, we are now in that period. So we've now seen that the, the growth rates in, in the various markets have gone back to the pre-pandemic market levels uh, and things seem to be stabilizing as we would expect to the more normal growth rates. Performance of the category you know, throughout that pandemic has been you know, really very strong. And I think it does demonstrate, as I said, that this is a very stable, robust, and, and highly profitable business. You're driving exceptional free cash, with the majority of our sales still being cash in advance. Um, today, it's still only 40% of households own an electric kettle, so there's still plenty of opportunity for us to go after. And our, fo our focus now still remains on territories like the USA, Russia, uh, UK, China, and increasingly India, as penetration starts to get closer to that tipping point of, of around 12% in that region. In kettles, looking a bit further forward from a development point of view, it, it really is business as usual for us. And we're always working on the next generations of controls with a focus of reducing cost, reducing the use of commodity materials and improving the automation. All of that while improving specifications to support our sustainability goals. The controls that we manufacture you know, in many respects are a, a simple mechanical switch, but they really are very precise components. Many of those have more than a thousand critical dimensions that we measure as they go through the production line. And we're always challenging the boundaries, looking for new materials, new technologies, as well as different ways of working to improve switch off times, which will obviously help to reduce the in-use energy usage. In 2021, we saw a number of new variants of our new 90 series, um, supporting a wide range of appliances, still helping to reduce costs, but also we're trying to help um, our OEMs who are building the kettles to reduce their costs. So they, we allow them to do more automation of the whole kettle progress, the, sorry, the whole, the whole kettle process 
um, reducing the cost of the overall product. And going forward into 2022 and beyond, you know, we're already working on that next generation. It will provide significant cost and specification benefits over the current range, uh, as well as rolling out a new kettle design service for our brand and OEM customers globally. So we move to, to slide on, on kettle growth. Um, back in the capital markets day, we estimated a CAG of around 3% and to increase our value share by 3% over a five year period. This year, not surprisingly, given that pandemic in, impact, we have grown actually 35% in the first half of the year, like for like, and we look to grow around 8% for the full year. So very much on target with what we're trying to achieve for that five year period and remain very, very confident in that, kettle, that core kettle business and our growth targets. So if we can then move into the water category. Uh, the water category has also had a very strong start to the year with a 98% growth, um, particularly with the full impact of Leica, which itself has shown a growth rate in excess of 20% year on year. However, yeah, we've had our challenging th challenges through that period for this category as well, particularly for our private label business with many of the retail outlets closed for quite significant periods. This has also limited the ability to launch some of the new products you know, effectively during first half. You know, a lot of the brands and retailers really like to launch their product in physical stores. And that has actually slowed things down a little bit in that first half, although we're now starting to see some traction coming through as we'll see you know, further in the presentation. In addition, we did see some, some issues in the Aqua Optima products, particularly in, with respect to Brexit, particularly trying to sell into um, parts of Europe, France and Germany in particular, where there were some significant increases of cost, increases of costs, as well as some quite um, strategic adverse pricing from our suppliers, who perhaps now see us more of a competitor. Um, most of those have now been overcome. Yeah, certainly, the Brexit issue has been resolved. We now have a, have a very nice factory in, in Italy. Uh, we've now set it up such that all our warehousing for Europe is done over in, in Lycra in Italy, as well as we can manufacture products in Italy for the rest of Europe. So those, those issues with respect to Brexit have gone. We've also started to insource a lot of the products um, into our new factory in China, removing some of those supply and price issues, uh, and we're becoming far more vertically integrated in that part of the business. And that's certainly the plans you know, for expansion into that new factory going forward. As we ease out of that pandemic, you are certainly seeing increased activity from those in-store sales. People in, in Italy, for instance, for the first time in, a, yeah, in the last month have been able to do face-to-face -face sales calls. Your shops are opening up you know, all across Europe as well. Yeah, and certainly we're starting to see you know, a lot of traction now coming for some of the new products. Yeah, we do have you know, a very extensive roadmap of new products being launched into the market. They include new tap filter platforms. They include new bottles and crafts using what is a, a new fast disk filter. Uh, I can actually probably uh, demonstrate or to show you that. Hopefully you can see this clear, clear, clear enough. Obviously the, 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 the bottles now are you know, a, a bit of a feature just about everywhere. They're more of a fashion statement, I think, than actually um, of, of use. Um, might have lost the presentation there. I'm hoping everything is, is still working there. So I'm just gonna carry on as normal. Um, it is Mark, but I thought I'd give people a closer shot of the oh, okay. product. Thank you. So this is just one of the uh, one of the, the new bottles from the Leica. Um, it has this this very very small filter inside. You know, most of the bottles the bottles you see today are just your know, fashion devices or vessels for carrying water. This actually has a unique filter in there. Um, very small. It, it takes out you know, most of the lime scale, a lot of the carbon deposits, and so on, uh, and actually improves the taste of the water. So that that will be used in a number of devices. It clearly could be used in in any types of bottles, being the, the physical size that it is. Literally just fits in the top of the cap. Uh, and once it's in there, you really don't know it's there. You can just drink through that filter. Um, also, we've got a whole new range of, of jugs coming to the market. And as I say, a lot of those now will be actually insourced into our new factory in China. Just as exciting for us is actually getting the approvals um, for our various products. That's been quite a challenge in the first half of the year. You know, a lot of those regulatory bodies weren't working to, to the full degree. Some only doing one or two days a week, particularly in the USA. Um, I'm pleased to say we now do have all those approvals, although somewhat delayed, and that will allow us now to start launching those products into the US in particular, but also into other parts of Europe and into China as well as we go into the back end of this year, and certainly uh, very well positioned uh, for the beginning of 2022 as well. In the past, we've talked about Halo Pure a number of times, there's been a couple of RNSs there, and obviously we made a commitment for 10 systems this year. I'm pleased to say we're still gaining traction there. We, we signed a very big contract with and the leading poultry supplier in, in China, 
uh, and they are now helping us to actually promote our products you know, across um, the farms within China. And we've now signed up seven contracts out of the 10. So yeah, very confident of hitting our target of, of 10 through the course of this year. Uh, and obviously for our five year plans there as well. You are gonna see a, a significant ramp up of new products during the next two years as we start to realize you know, the opportunities from the, the extensive roadmap of new products we had, as well as an increase of focus on expanding our geographical footprint, particularly now in the USA, Europe and China, where we've already secured several new contracts, as well as a new OEM in China to drive the app optimal sales um, going into next year as well. In terms of the growth um, on that slide, if you can move to the growth slide, um, you're back in November, you know, we set some, again, quite aggressive targets with a five-year period, uh, a CAGR of 27%. You know, we still remain totally committed to that target and we are making good progress despite all of those disruptions we've had you know, in the first half of the year due to the pandemic. This year, we are well on track to secure this growth with the first half at 98%, including the impact of Leica, and a forecast of 100% for the full year as we continue to drive those new products and realize the synergies between the various brands. The new products will, will form the next stage of our growth, opening up key markets and securing new contracts with the depth of products that we now have available in our portfolio. So if we can then move on to the appliance category, uh, the smaller domestic appliance segment experienced some quite significant impact as a result of the pandemic, you know, as, as we had successive lockdowns you know, all around the world. However, interestingly enough, the lockdowns prompted quite a big spike in the home appliance market with the GFK reporting a growth just on kitchen appliances of more than 20%. You know, back in our Capital Markets Day presentation, we had again set some very um, aggressive growth rates, 25.5% CAGR over a five year period. And again, I'm, I'm pleased to report we remain totally committed to this target and are making very positive progress towards it despite of all of that disruption. Hopefully you will have now seen the launch of the Aurora product. Uh, you'll see some of those behind me. I think they're probably still in view. Um, that, that launched on uh, Amazon in June, had a very, very positive response. It's a water dispenser that provides chilled water, purified water, and true boiled water. Um, and just about any other temperature can be programmed in between, as well as any volumes, whether it's continuous flow, one cup, two cup, and so on. This provides convenience and flexibility for the consumer, but it also provides a highly efficient heating and dispense system that will significantly reduce the energy usage you know, used you know, in, in life. And actually with a kettle, 95% of the energy of a kettle is actually in use. Only 5% of it is actually in the manufacture of a kettle. And all of that is done with the Aurora product with no preheating of water. So highly energy efficient, only boils the water you need and you start getting boiled water in just five seconds. Uh, for anybody looking for presents, it's actually on promotion in, in uh, Amazon at the moment. I think it's actually just, just changed price from 200 to 149. It is only promoted for a short period. So watch this space and uh, go, go and get your products early. Um, in that first month alone, actually the Aurora has, has now reached the top five of the hot water dispenser category on Amazon. 83% um, of the reviews across the UK retail landscape are actually four or above um, out of five. So we're really pleased with the way that's been, uh, been, been received. Perhaps even more um, pleasing is it's also been followed by the launch of a product uh, all-in-one beverage station from one of the largest global brands um, in the world. That is using Strix technology. Um, it launched about three weeks after our own product. Uh, they launched it first of all in Asia and shortly you'll be seeing those come into uh, Europe and, and the UK. They're currently at sea ready to be launched over here as well. But I think that that just gives another accolade to the, the, the sort of strength of that technology being used. Um, you're also going to see uh, the dual flow launch that's actually being launched in America here. Hopefully you can just about see this. I'm, I'm assuming my presentation is going to drop off a minute here. Um, some of you will have seen this before. It's taken a bit longer than I would have liked to get to market, but yeah, now is, is launched in North America. It looks like a, a standard kettle and works in the same way as a standard kettle. You can fill it up, you can boil the kettle uh, in the normal way. But if you press the side of the button here, which I'll try and do without looking, you get a small dispense out there and you can now put your cup underneath and Pushing the button on the top now will just dispense one cup of boiled water. The rest of the kettle remains cold. So you re remove all of that sort of overfilling and we're all guilty of it. The average is estimated to be a 30% overfill every time you make your, your cup of tea. So again, that's a, another innovation that has finally reached the market uh, and we'll start seeing that uh, being launched more globally um, as more and more brands uh, pick that one up. We've also seen launches of three new Leica products incorporating that, that fast disc filter. And, and we've also received our first order 
for what is a quite an innovative sterilizer dryer for the baby category over in the US. Um, a lot of you will remember those, those wonderful devices that, that you know, steam your, your, your bottles and, and so on. They can take anything from 20 to 30 minutes to get to the right temperatures and actually make sure you've got a sterilized product. The device we've got now will actually steam and sterilize your product in just two minutes uh, and it will dry them in a, in a further 20 minutes if you want them to be completely dry. So quite revolutionary in terms of technology and you're really excited to start seeing that hit the US market at the end of this year as well. So we have you know, numerous new products coming through for this category over the coming years. They're really just starting to get started with a new range of water dispensers, filtration devices, heating technologies, as well as some quite disruptive technologies. And what I'll show you briefly here, you can be first to see it actually, is a induction kettle. Um, so not yet on the market, it's gonna go into mass production at the end of this year in our own factory, in fact. Um, and this will come into market early next year. So it provides all the, um, the safety features and benefits of an electric kettle. Clearly there is no electricity supplied to it. It's just using the, the, uh, mag the magnetic force from the induction to actually boil your water. So yeah, quite disruptive and, and a very new technology obviously very, very um, well patented product as well as, as you get used to with strengths. So in terms of the growth, uh, again, as always, we've set some ambitious goals at the Capital Markets Day, this time a 25.5% CAGA growth. Uh, and as you can see, yeah, with a growth of nearly 900% in the first half of the year, albeit from a, a low base, and a projection of a 250% growth in the full year, yeah, we, we pretty much nailed that target. Um, both with the addition of Leica, but also with the work on our new products in 2020, really starting to gain traction. And as I mentioned earlier, there's around 18 new product launches that are going to take place during the course of this year. So you know, that, all that hard work in 2020 really starting to pay, pay dividends as, as we start seeing you know, that post-pandemic environment. So if I can move on to the ESG, um, again, this is, um, this is a really important part of our strategy. And today, or to say today on, on Wednesday, when we actually... Um, Put out our results we actually launched this this new strategy called sustainable innovative and dependable um, you can now see that on, on the website uh, on, our, on our plc website along with another document which talks about uh, uh, a diversity strategy as, as well the next few years we'll see significant planning and project execution as we really look to advance our kpis and set your know, ever ambitious goals but this is really a critical aspect of strict's mission to really innovate safety and design for a sustainable future and it's embedded in all parts of our business, particularly in the engineering side. The strategy document is now posted on our website uh, and as we, as we committed in our previous meetings. And we have come at this with our, our normal ambitious targets and a commitment to achieve net zero for scope one and two emissions by the end of 2023. Significantly ahead of the Paris Agreement. And I would like to hope you agree, you're know, putting us best in class and certainly ahead of our peers um, listed on AIM. As a major global employer spanning you know, multiple continents, Strix also prides itself on its gender makeup of the workforce. Uh, today, 60% of our employees are female and women have a 23% management represent, representation across the company. Um, looking forward, you know, we're gonna to continue to push the frontiers of our strategy and near-term projects will include a detailed analysis of scope three emissions and further work and actions you know, right across our value chain. Um, the next slide shows you the, the KPI measures um, that we've put in place. You know, certification and particularly ISO standards you know, really are at the heart of our business. They've, they've been an ethos of continuous improvement. Uh, and I'm really pleased and, and very proud to report that once again, we achieved benchmark status for our core operations, you know, the highest accolades you can get from the ISO audits. Again, our new, new site in China achieved accreditation to quality management, environmental management, and health and safety management with zero non-conformities in just a month after opening. Uh, and greatly obviously an exceptional achievement for the factory, but we also plan to achieve ISO 50001 for energy management by the end of this year. So again, very much focused on that, that governance side of the business and the continuous improvement. Obviously you can go in and look at those KPIs in detail yeah, on, on our website, and we'll obviously continue to report on those going forward. So if I can then move ahead to the outlook, you know, looking ahead, you know, we have a, a resilient business, which has again been clearly demonstrated by our performance over the pandemic with a very, very strong financial performance. You know, we are going to continue to invest in compelling growth opportunities supported by you know, a highly cash generative and stable core business. Of course, there's headwinds, you know, particularly in today's volatile post-pandemic environment. You don't know whether it's going to be gas, steel or something else that's going to be there next. Um, 
But yeah, in all those cases, we will continue to proactively manage and offset those costs through a wide range of efficiency measures, including price increases where necessary and strategic, other strategic initiatives as we have done during the, the, the pandemic period to date. So yeah, overall, we remain very confident of delivering 2021 full year results in line with the market expectations and executing on those medium term strategies to double the group's revenue over that five year period, primarily through organic growth in its water, in its water and appliance categories as we set out back in that capital markets day. And then finally, um, in terms of the investment proposition, if we haven't convinced you already, your strict has delivered you know, significant growth in its adjusted PAT for the first half, both against the pandemic impacted 2020, but also against 2019. We have a solid, resilient, uh, cash generative core business with a unique working capital cycle that benefits from both geographical and product diversification. You are going to continue to execute the efficiency measures and strategic initiatives to navigate any headwinds that come our way, you know, whilst continue to invest in, in future compelling growth opportunities. We are just one year into our five year growth plan, well on track and totally committed to delivering against our targets. And I really firmly believe here at Strix, you know, on the Isle of Man, we are establishing a world leading, innovative and sustainable technology business. So with that, I will pass back over to Hannah um, to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you to you both for that presentation. If I could remind our listeners that uh, now is the opportunity to submit any questions that you have. Um, first one uh, around acquisition. Obviously, you've got a stated ambition to um, double revenues within um, five years. Will you need to uh, make any more key acquisitions to achieve that? Um, no, the, 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 the growth that we quoted in our capital markets day was all organic including that of acquisitions we made such as such as Leica. So any other acquisitions we make in that period going forward would be either accelerating that five year plan or incremental to that five year plan. Um, you know, clearly, you know, now we've now we've finished the investment in the factory and, and you, we've acquired the Leica business. You know, we go back to being very cash generative. Yeah, you know, our, our cash to EBITDA ratio is typically somewhere between 80 and 85%. Um, and yeah, you know, we will have plenty of opportunity therefore to invest in, in further growth opportunities. I personally would be very disappointed if we didn't make further acquisitions during that period as well. A good marker, thank you. Um, could you please explain a little bit about the organic water aspect of the business? Mainly, what does organic water mean? Uh, when we talk about organic water, we're really talking about our organic part of the business rather than the acquisition. So obviously, Lycan was an addition to, to the business. So we, we try still to report sometimes back on the organic side of, of the, the, the growth rather than looking at it in total. Um, so that really is probably we're, maybe we're confusing the term slightly in, in that case. <laughs> As opposed to pure filtered water, which uh, we can get from the Aurora. Great. Um, one here, could we hear a little bit more about your own brand digital marketing plans? Yeah, that's, that's a, a really good question. I mean, obviously we came from being the sort of Keller business, which was very B2C. We had the Aqua Optima, which sort of, sorry, B2B. Then we had the Aqua Optima that started pushing us down that B2C route. And now, yeah, we've got a, a range of brands, particularly with Leica, yeah, Aqua Optima and the Australia, where we're really starting to promote our own products. You know, one of the things that we did during the pandemic is take quite a bit of time to sort of look at our business uh, and invest in our, in our people, both at management level, but also particularly in the marketing side and in the category, sort of the product side of the business. So we're very comfortable now that we've got the right people in the right places. We've got some really good expertise with the acquisition of Leica as well, which you know, helped to sort of um, position our strategy correctly. So what you will see from Strix going forward is a lot more work on our own marketing, primarily through that digital media, you know, making sure we can really pro promote the benefits and particularly sustainability you have our products going forward. You know, during the course of next year, you'll start to see things like your new websites, your commercial websites and all those sort of things coming through. Obviously, it takes a little bit of time um, and we're going through this sort of strategy process at the moment, but you'll start seeing you know, quite a lot of progress of that during the course of next year. Okay, thanks. And perhaps one for you now, Radress. Do you have um, any new large CapEx plans for the next year? So obviously, the factory is now behind you. Uh, or can we expect it to return to historical levels? 
Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's exactly uh, where we are standing right now. So the, the large cash outlets were incurred in H1 and then in H2, um, it's just op uh, normal operating cop uh, capex and usually it runs at about 8% of net sales. And then going into next year, um, unless we have some strategic initiative, in, initiatives like another m and if not, then it will continue to be about 8% of, net, uh, of uh, net sales. And then going into FY23, it should start to, uh, as a percentage, will start to go down to, say, 7%. Okay, thank you. Um, Strix has become more well known since floating on the uh, on the stock market. Is there a worry, if it could be a worry, that you might get bought by another firm or private equity outfit? Uh, Joe, you know, in, in our history, obviously, we we've been in private equity. Yeah, you know, when we when we sort of were coming out of private equity, we were looking at private sales and and further private equity sales and. You know, we as a management group very much favoured the the sort of AIM listed approach and you know, absolutely you know, listing in, in 2017 on AIM has been a transformation to this business and you know, it's, it's a breath of fresh air um, being in, in the environment we're in. You know, since then, you know, we've gone from being you know, um, 190 million cap to you know, over 700 million. So it's been a huge growth journey there. You know, we are we were very much you know, a very, very niche just with kettles. You know, clearly, we have grown now to have sort of a um, wider portfolio of products, but you know, our growth aspirations are already out there as well. Um, I, I think it would be unlikely you know, with a sh current share price to see somebody come in. I mean, you can never say never, um, but I think what I would, the, the message I would leave is you know, as a management group here, we are, we are very, very happy you know, working in AIM. You know, it gives us the flexibility to be able to invest where we want to invest. Um, you know, and we're getting you know, very good, good feedback from the institutions that have supported us through that time. So, yeah, it's certainly not something that we are actively looking to do. Thank you, Mark. Um, a follow on here from the um, earlier digital marketing question. Um, you mentioned the in-house design offer. Would you expect this to be a major revenue source? Um, no, no, it's not. And, and um, I'll be a little bit careful what I say, because obviously it's quite sensitive from, from a sort of a, competitive point of view. I mean, we have always um, developed industrial designs for brands and OEMs around the world, and we do you know, you know, many, many of those for most of the leading brands. Um, you know, what, we've, what we've done is we've just sort of refreshed that service so we can actually provide you know, a little bit more um, functionality in some of those things, in, in some of the devices being a little bit more, more, more differentiated in those, you know, just to try to give the, the brands, you know, more um, ability to differentiate their own products. I mean, the brands are always looking to find ways to differ themselves from other, other segments in there. And what we're trying to do is just to meet those needs by giving them a bit more flexibility in the design of some of those products. Okay. But incidentally, sorry, we don't, we don't actually charge for that service. We do that such that we get more kettle specifications so we can sell more controls. And obviously that, that, that results in increased uh, profitability from the extra sales. Uh, would you be happy to say which products from the water category are being produced in house? Um, at the moment, we, we've significantly increased um, the automation lines in our factory in China. So we are increasingly pr producing our filters, our, all our filters um, in, in China. Um, and we are also moving towards some of the, the basic appliances, you know, things like fridge jugs, for instance, you're part of which will start being built in our factory um, towards the end of this year. Okay, thank you. Um, are you? Uh, could you say what percentage of shareholders are institutions versus private? It, it's really hard to get to that number, actually, um, and I, I don't have a, an accurate number. I mean, the shareholder base has changed quite a lot over the over the four years. Um, so when we when we first came to market, it was one hundred percent income, and actually no retail were actually um, included in that in that first offering. Um, Today, you know, probably it's closer to around 50% of our income um, and the remainder are either retail or they are um, growth funds, some ESG funds as well. The last figures we saw for retail was about 14 to 15%, although it's very, very hard to get to an accurate number because quite a lot of the institutions actually are made up of, of a number of retailers. So actually the real number will be higher than that. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have uh, patents around the components that you produce in-house? Um, we, we are a company that will always try and find ways of, of patenting our products. Yeah, it's very important in the first sort of three to five years of development. So 
all of the, um, I'm trying to think now, all of the products that we talked about today, whether it's the Aurora, whether it's the induction kettle, even the fast uh, this filter will all have some level of patterns around them. Even the new kettle controls that we're bringing out in 2023, all will have new patterns you know, that will have a 20 year lifespan. So it's a very important part of our business here. I think it's, um, you know, as, as the products get older, it's less important because you can actually um, protect your, your, your products on copyright laws and on safety. Uh, but in the early days, patents are very important to us. So that's something we were always very focused on. Well, thank you to you both. We do not have any more questions. Um, so we are done well within the hour. Um, best of luck for the next six months. And we look forward to hearing from you at your full year results in March. Thank you very much, everyone. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.